Hi everyone. Uh, the Mechatronic and Industrial Automation Program, a program at Faculty of Engineering Gaia University, is pleased to host this webinar with Professor Rob Richardson, Professor of Robotics at the School of Mechanical Engineering, University of Leeds. This webinar title is Exploration Robots Toward Resilient City Infrastructure. We would we would like to welcome Professor Rob. Uh, he will start first with presentation about the topic, and after that, the discussion and the questions will be opened. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to write your questions in the chat, and I will take note of these questions. And if you want to participate in the discussion, you can use raise your hand option, and you will be, get permission to talk. Now we will move to uh, Professor Rob. To start, welcome Professor Rob. So good afternoon. Thanks for having me here today. So I'll, I'll share my screen and hopefully um, you can see it. Of course, any problems with, my, with seeing my screen, um, do um, raise a hand or something. So let me just do this. So, okay. Uh, just play that. Uh, okay, so so hopefully you can um, see my screen. If you can't, then please do chat or let me know. Fantastic. Yeah, Great. you can see it. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good. Oh, I've had one before. I've um carried on going and no one can see so it's good to see so yes anyway today i want to talk about um really robotics for um looking at um infrastructure and the different examples around that not all in infrastructure but some of them will be so let's just start there by thinking about what we're talking about when we talk about infrastructure we're talking about all of the things that are around us in the world that we use um, and I think I often say that infrastructure is one of the most important things you've given no thought to at all today. So things such as the structures you live in, the roads you drive on, we, of course, are all using right now electricity. We have water, we have gas, we have all kinds of things that we use in our houses that we really take for granted. These things just work and they should just work. Um, but of course, behind all that is lots of work to try to um, maintain these things, often with people, often causing disruption and so forth. So just some examples here. These are kind of more European examples, of course, but you'll have your own examples um, of, of amazing things you're doing. So houses, um, off the roads, um, under under the UK, we have lots of um, old sewers. These, these very large scale sewers here. So on the right hand side, um, very large scale underground sewer here. Um, of course, it's been there for 100 or plus years. It needs to be inspected and maintained. We, of course, have nuclear power stations and bridges. Bridges are very similar. They need to be inspected and maintained, and as they normally done by people. So we're looking at robots generally. So for robots to do stuff in these environments, they have to be able to explore, go out and find things. Um, and then, of course, once they find things that are not quite right, they try to repair them. That's what we're trying to do. So I'll give examples of this. Not all of them linked directly to infrastructure, um, but some quite closely linked. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is we have a large project in the UK, which is all about um, trying to stop street works. Um, so I was zero disruption from street works um, by 2050. So here's a typical UK picture. Um, lots of it right now um, around the roads where roads are closed off. So they're trying to repair the roads. They're trying to do things. They're trying to make things better, but causing huge amounts of disruption. So this kind of this kind of issue causes disruption in terms of waste your time, but also damages the environment by things being pulled out, but also damages the environment by things such as pollution. So your car stops, you're chucking out pollution into the, into the air. Um, so it's bad on all fronts. Interestingly, um, these roadworks typically are caused by small faults. So, for example, here is a picture of a UK um, pothole. 
Um, in this case here, what's happened is there's, there's a pipe, you can see probably on the screen, a pipe um, under the ground. This At some point, this pipe developed a very small fault. It probably developed uh, maybe a millimeter crack or some very small defect. This has caused water to leak out. That's washed away soil from underneath the pipe. Then the pipe has started to sag because there's no soil underneath it. Then it cracked further. Then it washed away more water. And before you know it, you've got an enormous hole underground, but it's all caused by a few millimeters of damage. So really our whole focus is around um, how can we intervene with robotics in a proactive way such that we don't um, cause, or that we can stop this kind of thing. So a few millimeters of material literally could prevent displacement of tons of material. It's that kind of level. And of course, for example here, literally to repair this hole, you're digging out things with massive diggers, you're putting in tons of material, all for a few grams of material. So it's, it's definitely a, a, a misbalance there, an imbalance between the engineering effort and the actual outcome. Um, so we have this thing, we want to use robots in environments. Of course, robots we class quite generally here. They can be drones, they can be ground robots, they can be all kinds of robots. Um, the challenges of doing that in the city, of course, are quite, are quite broad. So firstly, I'd call it an extreme environment. You may not think that towns and cities are extreme, but there's all kinds of wind and weather and rain. It's really a long way away from a, a normal environment. Of course, you've got to manage the energy, the batteries. If you want to repair things and you're flying, you need to be able to land, you've got to be able to communicate, and you've got to be able to do what we call semantic vision and navigation. So vision normally, you can imagine a camera, you take photographs, you can use vision to navigate in terms of avoiding things. But the next level from that is what they call semantic vision, which is actually you use vision to understand what you see. So it's not just a question of, there's a thing in front of me. It's a question of there's a thing in front of me. That's a tree. It's not going to move. That's a car. It is going to move. These kind of things. So the next level of understanding about the environment, of course, it does change. So one example here, we've been using drones to repair potholes, potholes in roads. Um, so here's a drone here. You can see it flying around. This drone contains a 3D printer. So it can fly to a location, it can deposit material. And again, it's, people think it's, it's a very strange thing. So you want to repair big holes in the road with a drone. How, how can it carry that much material? But just to remind you, we're talking about grams of material here. So on the road, if you have a small crack in the road, if you were to deposit some material, you could repair that crack, stop water getting into the road, stop the road becoming damaged, and therefore prevent very large problems. That's what we're trying to do. Um, so we have, um, I think, the world's only asphalt 3D printer. So asphalt being a material that we use in the UK to, um, to for road services. I guess it's the same in Egypt as well. Um, so we can 3D print. We have a very special 3D printer. We can 3D print with it. We also take our drones and we modify them with tracks so that we can drive around. So it's actually, oh, oh, maybe I won't go as far as saying it's the only one in the world, but one of very few in the world that actually can fly and can drive on the ground as well. So it's quite unique in that respect. Um, to 3D print things, we have um, this, this tank, like I say, so we put um, pellets in here, we heat them, we then use the nozzle, and of course the nozzle deposits material, and we use the 3D printing technology to be able to deposit it into certain cracks, into certain places in the environment. It gets quite warm, but like I said before, we don't need too much in the way of material. Um, here's, here's one of the tracks you can see here quite clearly. So it's, tracks are quite hard to design, in particular, making them that are quite strong, but very lightweight. So one of the reasons why you wouldn't want to have tracks very often is because you've got to fly around with them. It wastes energy, wastes um, material. Um, so you must make them very light. So we do that with this um, system here, and we, we um, have very light, very small motors, very light system, but it can, it can handle quite a lot of weight. So it has to be able to handle 20 kilograms of weight pushing down onto the track. Here's a quick video over here in the lab, just driving around. Um, oh, that's what here. So you can see that we have this system here with carbon fiber plates and the like, and belts that can drive around so we can land on the ground and then we can move between different cracks. That's quite important because it's a really 
energy expensive tasks to keep launching and relanding. It's fine to launch and go a distance away, but you don't want to be keep flying to go half a meter. That makes no sense. So you have the ground ground locomotion, the air locomotion, and then you can go around. You can deposit uh, materials. So here you can see it here. These are our mock cracks of um, surfaces, and we're able to use our printer to be able to deposit material into these cracks in order to repair them. It's also quite difficult, though, to be able to actually work out what is a crack. So one of the things that um, we've made a lot of progress with, but it's very hard, is understanding what is a crack. So from a computer vision point of view, you look at the surface here. I guess we can see quite clearly what are cracks, what aren't cracks. But there are there are also marks on the surface. I mean, this is just an example here. There are also marks on the surface. There, of course, will be marks that are dark, marks marks that are light. So trying to understand what you fill is quite hard. And of course, there's two things here you can do wrong. If you fill the wrong crack, you're just putting material in the wrong place, making a mess. Um, but if you miss a crack, then of course you're missing the whole thing and then you're going to get water ingress and you're going to have problems. So trying to understand that's hard. And in fact, what we've done is we've used lots of um, computer vision things, trying to understand about um, like how cracks propagate. So cracks have a certain kind of propagation typically. Of course, you've got these big cracks down here. But in terms of this kind of crack, you have kind of a, it's kind of a, I guess, a progression, almost like a tree root almost. It kind of grows, it propagates out. So you can use things like deep learning to try to understand this. It's hard to understand or try to train, and you, uh, try, hard to train from deep networks um, because we haven't got a lot of examples of cracks. And as you probably know, if you want to learn from computer vision, you need large amounts of information. So we did do some work actually looking at people's eyes, oddly. So eyes, um, of course, lots of lots of big databases around people's eyes that have been scanned for different optician appointments. Um, but eyes have veins and the veins have a typical propagation, of course, like a tree root where you have these kind of cracks that move along. So we did try and had some success in trying to learn how to see, pardon the pun, how to understand where cracks are from um, from looking at things like eyes, which is very difficult. But here you can see here, and of course, with 3D printing, so we're able to land and we're able to move to one position and we can actually move along the crack and we can deposit material along the crack. So computer vision to understand also how the crack moves and we can then track it and we can then deposit material along the crack. Such as that. That's not, not the best example, but you get the idea. That's what we're trying to do. Um, OK, so let me move on. So anyway, that, that's that's one, one thing we can do. We can deposit material um, on the structures. Another thing we can do is sometimes we want to inspect things such as bridges. Um, but we have to have, so you can imagine a drone flying around, you can get all kinds of video images from the drone, but sometimes you want to do contact measurement. So you want to be able to have a sensor on the structure. Therefore, you can do things like ultrasonic, so you can measure the thickness, the condition underneath the paint. So we've done that. We've had robots that can fly and can deposit material um, onto, of deposit a robot onto a building. So I'm going to show a video here. I'll take Um, that works okay. So what, what we're doing here is we have a drone, we have a small robot inside that drone, and we fly under a bridge, and we stick the robot onto the bridge, and then it drives around and can then inspect on the structure. Very importantly here, it's a contact inspection, because we're on the surface of the bridge, we can actually record information and we can measure things. So that, that contact is what we're trying to get. So the drone can fly away, it can still do the, the actual external um, video scanning, the actual structure, but the robot itself, you know, the robot itself can actually go away and um, and measure that condition of the structure. It's very, um, and it's, it's the robot's quite quite capable. It can go around all kinds of metal structures. It can go around bends. What we haven't done yet is we haven't actually been able to pull the robot off. So right now we can fly around. We can put it on. That's okay. Trying to get it off is actually much more of a challenge. That's what we're working on right now. So that's that's kind of at the premise of our of our main cities project. 
Of course, recently we've had an issue with um, COVID as we have around the world, um, lots of problems with things. So what we've done is we've taken some of our technology in this project and we've applied it towards disinfection robots for, for COVID. So I'm going to show you a bit of information now about how we, um, how we did that. Um, let's go on to the next page. Because of the virus outbreak, self-preparing cities... I'm not going to bore you with my voice on that. Let me dim, dim it down. Um, let me fast forward a little bit. Um, so what we're doing is we're taking robots and we're having them such that they can go around um, infrastructure, or sorry, in terms of like infrastructure hubs, such as airports, such as um, the city centre, and we're using robots to automatically go around to be able to spray disinfectant and therefore sterilise environments. So here we've got it in the in Leeds Bradford Airport, which is in Leeds, of course, in the UK, not far from where I live. Um, and we can start toward this. Yeah, so here we are going around automatically spraying a bench so it can do so. I'll show you in a second. It can find benches and we can spray spray um, disinfectant to do it. We also have a legged version, um, very similar, similar process. We, of course, we're building models of the environment. Here's a model of the airport foyer. So we can automatically navigate around and then we can spray onto different services um, to disinfect um, the environment. So this is really around high touch areas. So you wouldn't do it everywhere, but things such as airports, things such as very, very popular benches in city centres are, are something you definitely want to clean fairly often. Um, so yeah, as you can see here, we're in Leeds and we're able to spray and disinfect different areas. So yes, yeah, so we've gone forward and we've done that and that's gone quite well. Um, just an example here, this is an example of the semantic vision. Um, this is actually done mostly from um, standard um, ROS robot operating system packages, but we were able to drive around and we're able to, to, to predict and try and understand where things are. We're trying to find things like benches here. Of course, we know roughly where we are with GPS. Um, but we have to go away and find um, find benches and avoid people, of course. We don't want to hit people. Um, so you can see we're going around here and we're able to find things. So when you disinfect a bench, it's actually very hard because you need to find the bench first, but then you have to plot and intercept things. So it's not enough to find the bench and just point a spray at it and do it. You want to drive alongside the bench and spray the disinfectant along the, along the bench. So there's quite a lot of computational things there about how you intercept an object. You want, to, you want to basically drive past it. So find where it is, drive next to it or align yourself with it, and then drive along parallel with it. And of course, then you're spraying the bench. So it's not quite as simple as just, oh, here's a bench, let's squirt it. You have to plan how you then go about disinfecting it. And if you make a mistake, and if you don't disinfect the whole bench, for example, you, you only get half the bench, then that's almost worse than not doing it all together because then, you think it's been cleaned, but it hasn't been cleaned. Of course, that's a bad thing. Um, yeah, so lots of work in that area we've been doing. We've also been doing some work in um, urban firefighting, again, linked with this kind of um, city's sort of promise, city's premise. We're involved in the MBZ competition, which was um, the one done in, it's done in March recently. So it's an international competition where um, many teams around the world went to the UAE and um, were able to um, compete and do things. So we, we did this in, in different challenges. And we had a firefighting robot, which I'll show you now. So this is the, what we were trying to do is trying to get these drones and ground vehicles to fly towards a structure and to be able to um, automatically put the fire out. I think one of the things here is that um, in terms of the business case for these things, it's quite interesting. So is there a business case to have firefighting robots, for example? Um, I think the, the odds, probably the answer is probably no, generally. So if you were to have this, you have every fire service in, in, in your country, in, in my country, carrying robots that are ready to go, that are ready to put out fires. For most fires, they're just not needed. And they might be useful tools, they're not needed. The bigger business case, if you imagine the future city, like I mentioned before, the smart city, full of robots doing day-to-day -day jobs such as repairing roads, repairing bridges. If a fire occurs, these robots will be retasked to go and put out the fire. So then that's where that's where the value comes from. They're, they're doing work all day long, every day, but they're able to retask themselves to be able to go away and actually put fires out. Um, and that way you haven't got a situation where you've got lots of fire engines full of robots that are not being used. Um, that's what's gonna happen in the future, I think. So yeah, so lots of things like firefighting drones. Um, in the competition, of course, it was um, 
deliberately, um, um, I guess it's a mock scenario, not a real scenario, um, but we have to go and try and shoot water at, at targets. I'll show you a quick video here of some of the work we're doing to do that. Okay, clear. Back off. So yeah, drones flying towards locations, automatically spraying liquid onto hot areas. And of course, in this competition, they're collecting the water. So you win by firing as much water as possible so they can collect the water. And farm. They're both air and ground rivers we have in this competition. Multiple air vehicles, so three, three drones, one ground vehicle, all coordinated to go around and spray try and fire. So it's quite hard to detect fires and, and put them out. So here we've got a video from the sensor from the robot cameras. And um, we've got the actual vision system on the left, or top left, I should say. On the on the right hand side is a thermal image. So here we can see it's a very poor, well, really poor quality thermal camera. But we can see the, the, the heat there. It's not massively different, of course, as the flames dispersing, but you can see the heat point there. On the bottom left, we have a depth sensor. This is us looking at the depth, how far away we are from the object. Clearly, we don't want to hit the wall. We want to get close to it. We don't want to hit it. So we've got a depth sensor there about how close we are. And the bottom right, we have a fusion of the actual fire. And we're trying to identify where it is. So you can see that blue sort of thing is us trying to work out the heat spot. But you can see the challenge here. Let me go back a second. Um, the challenge here is that the point of heat spot is not necessarily the point of the fire. So where you spray the liquid is quite difficult because you might spray onto the very heat, the hot point that might be above the fire, um, but you want to spray. So we have to do lots of work to try and recalibrate it to try and make sure we're actually shooting the water into the hole. Of course, this is a, this is a, this is a um, not a real situation. But ordinarily, you don't necessarily want to spray to the hottest point. You want to spray to put the fire out. So you need some kind of way of understanding about heat and about where the fire source is and trying to you know, much smarter than just, say, find something hot and squirt water. You need a kind of a, a smart system to be able to go away and actually be able to, um, yeah, put the fire out. So, yeah, that's our work on that area there. Um, we did do a documentary, so if, if you uh, would like to um, check out some more information. So this, this was really just about, it's a film about our um, our adventure, if you like, in, in this competition. So it's kind of a, a fly in the wall kind of film. So it's not a, a high tech film. It's more kind of fun, just showing us trying to trying to win the competition, trying to do things. So do check it out if you'd like to. The link's um, here. I'm sure we'll get a link to you later on if you haven't got it right now. OK, let's carry on going. So. Um, one of the things I guess that I've done, which I'm very proud of in my life, is um, did some work to explore the beautiful Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. I'm sure many of you, or probably all of you, have been there. It's, it's stunning. Um, so we were doing some work um, for a few years ago now, probably about 10, um, 15 years ago now, looking at um, using robots to try to understand some more of the information of the Great Pyramid. Um, as you all know, um, the Great Pyramid is full of kind of different mysteries and different secrets. If you take the pyramid, if you cut it in half, it's full of all these kind of different um, shafts and things in there. So we were trying to understand what these so-called air shafts are for. So these shafts going from the center point here towards the outer casing, they don't leave the casing, they kind of, they stop. And we were trying to build robots to understand and really get scientific data. So that was the main thing here. Can we, can we understand the orientation, the angle of them, where they go to, um, so we can actually understand much more. They're quite small. So the actual um, shafts themselves, um, th these things here, tunnel entrance, are about 20 centimetres by 20 centimetres. They're quite small. Um, so there's no real way of exploring these shafts without robots. They go on 40 metres, so quite a long way into, uh, inside the pyramid. Um, so the, it's very hard to understand what they're for. So that's why we're using robots to try and climb and try and explore the environment. Um, when you climb inside these shafts, they are beautiful, mostly clean, mostly kind of um, very well sculpted. There are a few places where you have different features, such as on the left hand side here, we have a, 
we'll call a lateral shift. So this block's moved out. On the floor here, we have a, a step on the floor um, in, in, in picture B. Um, bear in mind, these are looking up. So although it looks like it's straight along here, you're actually looking up an angle of 40 degrees. So when you're trying to climb inside these shafts, um, you have to try and negotiate these quite complicated um, different areas and different structures. Um, we knew from previous people doing work, there was a space. So this, this, is a, this is a diagram at the top of the shaft here. So after all this distance here, 63 metres at the top here, we end up with um, a stone called a blocking stone. There's a space, no one was quite sure what was there. And there's a, what they call maybe maybe a second blocking stone, maybe not, we don't know. But anyway, there's a space behind the first one, and then there's a, something behind the second one, either a massive block or not. And we would, our task really was to climb, climb these shafts, get to the end, explore this space here, and then try to understand this stone here. Uh, I guess I'll spoil the punchline, as probably you already know. We didn't manage to get to this second stone, um, but we have looked at this behind this first stone, what we did. So in order to climb these shafts, you want to, of course, have no damage. You don't want to scratch the shafts or do any damage. So we looked at different ways of making robots that can climb the shafts. And then we used the inchworm, inchworm mechanism. Inchworm is an amazing little creature. It has two points of contact front and back, and its body flexes. So you can see how here it's climbing a structure here. So we tried to use that inspiration to build robots. Um, and here's our solution. Of course, it doesn't look like a worm. That's fine. Um, but you'll see here we've got a, a robot front and back carriage. These can move slide forward and backwards. We have pads that come out front and back. And these pads come out front and back and grip the side. So effectively what you do, you grip, grip at one point, you release at another point, you then extend or contract the robot and then change how these grip and slowly, slowly you can kind of climb the shaft. The really beautiful thing is here, it has no scraping part. So these wheels here are not driven. They're passive. They just roll freely. They just they just prevent from scratching the floor. All of the work's done front and back. It's like almost like climbing a rock face. Um, but there is no scraping, no damage that way, which of course is very important for us to do. Um, and it's not shown this picture before. And here we are doing an expedition inside the shaft, and you can see us here working there to do things. And here's the robot going in. So um, very slender, very light robot. People often ask me when they see the robot for real, they say, well, that's great, but where's the kind of the really big metallic robot? Where's the, where's the, you know, the cast iron, the industrial bulletproof robot? The point here is that you want as light as possible. And it's really an escalation of arms. So you could, you could make it very strong out of metal, but then you need bigger motors to climb. Therefore, it becomes heavier. Therefore, you need a stronger structure. There's an escalation almost of kind of, of, of a criteria. So what we did, we, we, we did the, the reverse, we de-escalated. So we made it as light as possible, less motor power, really try to shrink it right down to as simple as possible. And that worked really well. We ended up with a very lightweight robot. And if I could, I'd make a cardboard robot or even, even a paper robot. You know, it, sh it should be as light as possible. There's no reason to make it strong if it doesn't need to be. So it worked, worked really well. And you'll see here, we're, we're driving through the shaft here, we're climbing up um, different angles here. You see the, the original builder mark here, which is very interesting on the road, on the, on the wall here. Climbing up the top here, and of course, we're able to go to the top here. This was a hole drilled previously by somebody else. Um, and you'll see here the robot just at the top of the shaft, just um, getting quite close to the end. Um, so at the very end of the shaft, it's really beautiful condition. And of course, we have, we have multiple cameras on here. We have 12 cameras. So we can see everything. We can see all different angles, all different things. They're very low, they're low quality, especially they were 10 years ago when we did this work. Um, but um, it means we can see all the angles to make sure that we're safe and doing no damage. And here's some of the outputs. Um, so we saw the actual stone. We can see this is quite interesting here, the ledge here. That tells us something about how it was constructed. If you look through the hole, we found some writing, which was great on the floor behind the hole. We found some drawings and different symbols, which is amazing. Um, and we also were able to look back. So if you remember the first, this zone here has these hooks here. We put a camera through there, a snake camera, and we could look back on ourselves. So we could see the reverse of these pins. So again, we answered a question here about what, what, where do these pins go to? And they go to these small loops. 
these small loops are too small to be able to carry the weight of the stones. So they weren't a, they're not a structural thing um, for that. So I think it's obviously decorative, but you know, really nice result to understand what they're for. And I mentioned at the very beginning, um, we didn't actually manage to um, answer the main question, which would one day um, would love to hear, is really what what is what is going on here? Is this a part of the pyramid, a very large block? Is it another small stone? Um, so it's a mystery that endures. One day we'll find out the answer, and that'd be amazing to know. Um, as with the other one, there is a documentary. We, we, we like making these films, so do check out the documentary here. A very similar, similar kind of style of thing. So it's quite informal, um, but it talks about our our work and how we try to explore the pyramid and what we found um, with some lofty footage of us doing it. So do check out that. It's good, good to good to go and see and understand what we're doing. Um, okay, let's carry on going. Um, so we're at half past now. It's good. We've got more time. Um, so I want to talk, I guess I'm getting towards the end of the talk. I, well, one more thing, perhaps, and then we'll have a chat about what's going on. Um, so we had another robot expedition. This was about um, how we can understand how much water is stored on the um, the glaciers in Everest region, near Nepal. Um, so the actual amount of liquid water in this area is very important for global warming. Because, of course, you can imagine melted liquid is heat. So if you understand how much water is stored there, you understand how much heat, how much melting. Um, so what we wanted to know is how can we calculate how much water, how much liquid water is there? So, of course, you can see the surface of the lake from either the air or from satellites. So, you know, the surface area. But what we don't necessarily know is what's below the surface how deep it is, what shape it is. Um, you can make assumptions, but we didn't know. So we were trying to understand, um, yeah, what, what is below the surface of the water. Working in this here, the Kumbu Glacier region, um, around here we we're working on between um, Tibet and Nepal and over here. So we're looking at, looking at that kind of area there. And like I say, trying to understand how much water, liquid water is in this, um, in this environment. Um, it's, it's really hard to do. <laughs> So this, this work is done by boats. People will carry inflatable boats to, to, to lakes and they will go and try to inspect it and measure things. You, know, you can imagine dropping wires down. You can do all kinds of things to understand the under surface shape of the lake. That's done on larger lakes that are typically quite easy to access or easier to access. The problem is that there are many, many small lakes higher up that you really can't carry large boats to. It's too difficult. So the task was to build a small autonomous robot that can be deployed on these smaller lakes and automatically map the, 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 the below surface shape of these lakes. So here we have a backpack portable thing we'd be built. You might look at it and go, well, it looks, looks a bit messy. It looks a bit like I've made it in my garage. It looks like unprofessional. I think the thing here to point out is that it needs to be made so that it can be assembled when you're wearing big gloves. So you'll see here we've got bolts like on a door, like on a gate. And we have these massive pins here. But this means that we can undo this inside here is batteries. We can undo it using very thick gloves. So you can pull the pin out. What you do, you pull these pins out, you undo these things, unlock them and it all comes apart. And I say there's no fiddly screws, there's no parts that come off, there's no screwdrivers. You can literally, in a few things, pull it all apart. The same here, you see the ones over here. Um, so it can be ported in, it can be transported in two or three bags. We'll have a winch to lower down um, for temperature sensing. We can, of course, we can measure depth with sonars, two propellers, and enough batteries so that it can run for two days. So each each deployment is not two days. Um, but by having two days of deployment means you don't have to worry about changing the batteries. Turn it on, turn it off, go out there. Um, in reality, it's probably worth three or four days of, of doing things because you won't need it for that long. Um, again, just to make it as simple as possible. I mean, here's a it's beautiful photograph. I, I wasn't actually there on the expedition. I wish I was. But you can see here the beautiful scenery. You can see down here, maybe at the bottom here. I'll zoom in. There's a very small boat down there. I'll zoom in. So you sit just at the bottom there on the water there, ready to go. 
I mean, what, what an amazing place to work. What a beautiful place. Um, but yeah, so we're there deploying the things. Um, if you ever wonder what it would like to, what it'd be like to go on a glacial melt lake, here's a video of that. So the boat, this is just the boat being driven remote control around the lake to test it. Interestingly, though, I mean, obviously, there's a nice um, motivation in terms of being able to get to easy locations. But you can see, if I go back a second, actually, here, you can see here, potentially, it's quite dangerous. If you want to come over here, there are all these things falling off the actual rocks there. So you really wouldn't want to be on a boat here, anywhere, anywhere close to here. This whole face could fall off. Um, so, yeah, so, so there's a second reason why you'd want to use an autonomous boat. Is to be able to go away and able to look at the environment like that. So what we did, um, in order to work autonomously, I say autonomously, I guess it's kind of semi-autonomously. Um, what we did, we, we, we drove manually around the outside. So you see on the left-hand side figure, these dots are manually driven. So you drive around the outside, that outlines the perimeter, and then you press go, what we're trying to do is trying to do a spiral search, trying to effectively get, get to the center and kind of spiral out. You can see here it didn't quite work. That's OK. I mean, there, of course, there are, there are different kind of winds and different kind of things. It didn't quite work that way. It kind of went in different places and had to correct itself. Um, but by doing that, you can see we're trying to get dots across most of the area. Um, we, don't, don't, we don't need to cover everything precisely. If we've got enough dots, we can get a good estimate of how deep um, things are. Um, so you can see the dots here. You can see on the right hand side here, this is a contour plot taken from these points. So you can see actually we can get a good contour plot from these points, even though the points aren't totally symmetrical. Um, and you see the shape here and the depth of them. So this is, this is one um, sort of fairly smallish um, um, sort of uh, melt, melt water. It tells us the depth. So it's really nice result, worked really well. Um, of course, the power in this, it's nice to identify a particular location, but these freeze and they un unfreeze. And it's, it's not, you know, it's not like you can say that will be forever that depth. But I mentioned at the very beginning, what we're trying to do, trying to get a correlation between the surface of the actual um, water and the depth. So you look here, this is, this is a graph. So um, the bottom of the graph is area. You can work out the area, of course, say from the sky, um, looking um, down and work the area out. This is the volume on the left hand side going up. The blue dots are from the previous work, not from us over the years. People have been out there measuring this using boats. And of course, you'll see the blue dots here, as I said before, are in larger lakes easier to get to um, so these blue dots. What was missing was what is going on down the bottom here, because although there are smaller lakes, there are many of them. There are many, many more smaller lakes and bigger lakes. And you can see here our data. The real beautiful result of this is that our data sits bang on this line here. So from now we can actually there's a linear relationship between area and volume. I mean, you might have guessed this, but there's no way of, no way of being sure. So now what it means is that you can take a photograph from the sky across all these ranges. You can work out the size of them, the volume of them, and therefore how much water is on these lakes um, over any time period, any part of the season. So it's actually a really nice result um, that we can go, which is good. Um, so I'm running out of time. Mohammed, do you know how, how long do I want me to talk for? Uh, you can, if you have, you, if you want more, you can continue. There's no problem. OK, maybe I'll just talk very briefly a little bit further then, but I don't want to, I want to give time for, for, for chats and things. Um, okay. So let me go on to, I'll skip forward to, um, I'll tell you one more thing then, one more project um, that I'd like to talk about. So we have a project called PipeBots. This is all about um, robots to go underground. So this is about swarms of robots that actually can be permanently underground that can inspect and maintain the underground environment. So this is obviously a video here. It's obviously not, not real yet. We started this project about a year ago. We've got five years to go on it. But the ultimate vision is literally to make these little walking robots. So underground pipes are leaking, as I mentioned before. Um, 
So we're, we're looking to make these autonomous robots. They really are small. So 20 millimeters, really small robots that can be underground, as I said before, for years. So you lower them down, they go underground, they can then go around and they can then inspect and they can build maps and they can try to find um, faults underground. Um, so they're aquatic, so they need, need to be able to deal with both things that are wet and not wet. Um, not get lost, not going to the wrong location, that'd be really bad. Um, so live underground and do that. So this is, of course, is very much science fiction right now, um, but we're making progress. So we've done some work in a couple of, this is one example here. And this is a semi-aquatic robot here. So you can see it's got a camera, it's got these things here, so it can move around both in kind of sludge material and not. So what I showed you in that video is mostly sewage pipes. So we are working on fresh pipes, which are normally pressurized with clean water. But we're also working, of course, in sewage pipes. Um, and sewage pipes typically are half air and half water, or sometimes fully um, actually air, depending on what, what point of the day they're being used in things. But yeah, we've been building some robots to do that. Um, another example here of one of our robots for the larger sort of scale of things. This robot's not great for dirty pipes, but it's really good for going around um, in kind of um, open open pipes going around. I'll show you a video here. Actually, there's a video. I'll show you. Um, sensing. I'll show it going in. Uh, go Testing at yeah. the integrated civil and infrastructure research. Yeah, so you can see here inside pipes. This is one of our larger ones. So we have. Really, it's going to be um, a combination of large and small ones. Um, so the large ones going in larger pipes, the small one going in smaller pipes. Um, but really, our, our ultimate goal is this swarm of um, probably around about 100 robots. So you drop them all in there, they all go around, they search themselves. There are all kind of issues around that, though, in terms of how do you um, detect them when they're going to fail? So you don't want them to fail and just be left there. So how do you pre-predict they're going to fail? So Robert goes, I'm getting a bit old now. I better go back to my um, my depot and effectively expire myself. Do we recycle the parts? Do we have a machine underground that takes old robots, takes them apart, then reassembles new robots? Um, so lots of things going on like that. So this, this, it's quite early state, <coughs> excuse me, quite early stages right now. Um, but we've got um, four years to go away and do this. It's a very large pro program in the UK government. So, yeah, we're quite hopeful to get this system. So in, in three years time, hopefully we'll be have swarms of these robots going around and doing amazing things. OK, I think I'll call it a day there to give a chance for questions. But anyway, thanks for your thanks for your attention. And um, yeah, great to chat to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for this presentation. It's actually a very nice presentation. Uh, uh, if anyone has question, he can uh, just uh, click on raise hand uh, button so that he can talk. I'll stop sharing the screen so that I can see what's going on. Yeah. I also allowed uh, all the participants so they can talk. Uh, actually, I had a question. Uh, I, uh, what do you think about uh, now with the Industry 4.0 and uh, the trend toward smart cities? What will be the future of robotics? And as well, the the, the current regulations and those maybe need some adaptation and it change in order to allow to use robotics in smart cities and infrastructure. So what what do you think that uh, what it changes need in order to push forward uh, the infrastructure robotics and robotics in a smart city to be in reality? Yes, a great question. I mean, there, there are different levels of, um, of things going on. So there is, as you, as you say, the, um, the regulation 
I think for the regulation, it's it's upon us to to prove the technologies are adequate. So people often moan about regulation, like um, in the UK, lots of work on drones. You know, I want to only take my drone to fly and deliver a package. I can't do that. The regulation is stopping me. The problem with that is, though, that you know the regulator, of course, wants to make sure things are safe. So it's, it's on us to make a a safety case, a real safety case for what they call flying beyond line of sight. So robot flying away where you can't see it. Um, and we have to prove that, as you actually prove that robots won't fail um, or how they will fail. So it's not good enough to say it won't fail. Uh, it'll be about a thousand hours, it will fail. How do we prove that? How do we have evidence that really, really can prove that? So there's a whole piece of work around that, how we can actually go around quantifying failure and we have to do that in order to be able to convince people that things are safe. So that's one thing. That's one, one of the barriers, of course. And the more you let robots be out there by themselves, the more often than there are, the more things will go wrong. So our vision of 2050 um, of this city, so we're talking, people say to me about the vision, they say, you know, 2050, you know, you're crazy. You think how, how much um, we've got um, mobile phones have come on. Mobile phones have, have come on so far in the last five years and you're telling me it's going to be 30 years before we've got robots doing these things. But my, my, my response to that is, well, bear in mind, we're talking about probably in a medium sized city. We're talking about 100,000 robots all out there, all fully under their own control. Clearly, there's someone somewhere with able to control them at a very high level. But the day to day things, there's going to be 100,000 robots automatically doing things. I think maybe 30 years is a big enough step to that direction. So. Um, so yeah, so there's obviously these, these kind of barriers to go forward. One of the things we're doing in the UK, um, we've got a big program of research called um, Trustworthy Autonomy, and this is all about really how we can, how can we be sure what robots will do? How do we know that? So it's, it's about 35 million UK pounds, which is quite a lot of money, um, and it's all looking at say there's things, things beyond robotics, so ethics, trust. Verification, so verification being how do we mathematically prove the robot will do things at different times? That's really hard. So it, it, it's not a question, again, of like saying, well, okay, here's a, here's a code, it, 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 do, do 10 runs, it's avoided that box, it hasn't hit somebody. How do we mathematically prove the robot won't do that? And that's really, really hard to do. Um, uh, and we're working on that right now, this, this program, um, say ethics, trust, um, lots and lots of things we're trying to do. And even philosophy in that, you know, how, how do you, what should it do? I mean, the, the old thing about autonomous cars, if um, if there's a person um, um, in the way and the autonomous car comes towards it, does the autonomous car hit that person and save you or does it injure you and hurt that person? Um, and that's something we have to hard code in the robots. So autonomous cars have this problem, but so will these robots. 100,000 robots out there, maybe there's two buildings on fire. Which one does it put out? You know, it's going to constantly encounter these things. As humans, we can do it all the time. We're able to go away and, um, and make these choices. But how do robots do it? And how do we reconcile who is responsible for that ultimately? That's a big challenge. So I'll pass on. I'm talking a lot here, so I'll pass over to any more questions. Okay. Uh, actually, yeah, I think there are many challenges for uh, robotics to be in a smart city or to be in direct contact with robotics. Uh, but for example, if we look for industrial robotics, it's it's actually has its obstacles and it become more mature. And a lot of factors now is fully automated. It's based only on robotics as well in agriculture applications and uh, smart farming robotics now there are many in uh, commercial robots used but uh, as you said there are like uh, uh, many challenges in uh, robotics in infrastructure in uh, smart cities in to be in direct contact with a uh, human uh, they I actually uh, professor uh, Ahmed uh, Munib Sabah he has a question so he can Talk. Uh, thank you, Muhammad. Th thank you, Rob, for your uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, such a long time, I don't have uh, such presentation. Uh, it took me uh, along for uh, my work uh, uh, in Europe. So uh, let me uh, 
cut it short and uh, uh, shoot my questions. Uh, first question about uh, uh, you are talking at the end in your project Biopet on the like uh, small robots or but you don't have uh, told us about the uh, micro robots for uh, thrombosis for biomedical applications. Uh, are you working in uh, such track or not? That's my first question. Uh, maybe better you can uh, uh, reply my questions, then I go to the second. Sure, yeah. So, so uh, personally, I'm not doing a lot of work in medical robotics right now. We have done in the past. So we have a, a nice piece of work we did in the past looking at um, robots inside the body for, for a surgery and um, making robots like um, small tree frogs. The tree frogs stick to wet surfaces. So we had some work building small robots that could go inside the body through keyhole surgery and um, being able to um, walk around with a camera and using using the idea of um, <clears throat> and the tree frog's feet to stick to wet surfaces so that it wouldn't fall off. So we, we have done some work in that area. I mean, we tend to work in the area of, I would say, things that you can pick up and things that you can move. So we're not doing very large industrial diggers and we're also not doing um, things that you can't really see. So going down to kind of the real micro level of things. So I guess the smallest we're looking at really is robots around about 10 millimeters. I mean, very small and the components are even smaller, um, but we're not going down to the really, really small level um, in, in the work we're doing at the moment. Uh, okay. Uh, may I go to the second question about, uh, you talk about the firefighting and uh, uh, sometimes we have the problem that the the most uh, or the hottest part is not the source of the fire. Uh, so it there is uh, some questions like uh, how the I mean it's like image analysis to decide which point is the source point of the fire. Is it the case we have? So I think it comes down to semantic vision. So I think it comes down to this thing about really understanding the environment. So we did a very crude thing. We were looking at you know what's hot, how far is it away. Mm -hmm. I think what you really want to do is be able to go in a room, find heat spots, but also look for things, you know, like the bed, understand the materials even. So there's a bed. On top of the bed will be some clothes. That's probably flammable. So you can probably have things. If you can identify what objects are what, you can then make decisions about, you know, the possibility or the probability of that being the fire source. Mm -hmm. And then you can look at, you know, trying to shoot that particular object rather than the heat source. So there's, we haven't done that. That's really out of scope what we, what we would do. But... I think that's what's required, that kind of level of intelligence about um, what's going on. We do have some work we're doing with um, looking at asset inspection for underground pipes, where we do some work where we interview people, um, people who are experts in pipes. Um, so they, so people are, you know, you show them photographs of a pipe, you ask them um, what's the condition, you interview them, and we can capture their knowledge, and then we can put that into computer AI stuff. So we could do the same thing on this. We could actually go away and we could actually get firefighters to say, here's a fire. What mm -hmm. would you do? And try and capture their knowledge rather than saying, well, where's the heat source and that kind of thing. Yeah, sometimes we can solve the, uh, this problem by, uh, yeah, AI is tough and uh, some decision making, uh, 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 I mean, uh, procedure. But uh, as I read uh, for the autonomous uh, car, for example, we have the problem of uh, sometimes we have moral problems uh, when we uh, uh, having a car. Uh, should we uh, and we have only one alternative? Uh, should we hit the the old one or the 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 young person? The you know such things. So uh, does it belong also to the uh, artificial intelligence or something like this, or we have other problems? As I read that you are a program uh, director of multidisciplinary, so you have other problems, not only robotics, but you are working with multidisciplines. Yeah, so it definitely is. This is the thing about trustworthy autonomy. I think it's going to become more and more the case in terms of, and I say there's lots of ethics in that, so I'm part of a, a verifiability um, part of that, where we're looking at because for mathematical things. But there are other people who are, you know, very large programs looking at kind of the ethics and looking at other things. And I think that's where it comes into. And we have to have that a much more serious look at it. I think we, we all know the dilemma. We all know the choices and how hard it is. Mm -hmm. But we need to have some really formal understanding. And it's not for, certainly not for me. I'm as an engineer, I can't decide that. I need people who understand this and also legal people. So in this particular activity of trustworthy autonomy, there are lots of lawyers in there as well and understanding, you know, what, what is the legal implications in that? What, what should it be? So it's, it's a much bigger thing than just the engineering. I think it's a much more societal thing we have yes. to do. 
Yes, I agree. Uh, okay, I will leave the stage now for Dr. Gabra, I think. <laughs> or Dr. Mawad. Uh, thanks, Dr. Ahmed. Just I uh, have a question about computer vision. So, what sort of uh, what is the state of the art in robotics now in computer vision? Uh, so, do you use the same object tracking stuff that is used in generic computer vision? And how do you account for things like out of distribution when you are using robots uh, to search for something, but you get like a concept evolution or whatever a new class of things that the robot has has been trained on. So uh, I'm just curious about what, what is the computer vision state of the art in this area? Mm. Thank you. So yeah, so I guess we tend, we're not we're not really pushing the boundary in that area, I suppose. So we're using lots of the techniques for computer vision, and we don't we say we're not really putting new things. But yeah, the things we're doing, we're using kind of standard packages for for the vision in terms of like um, semantic vision. There are some really great things in say in ROS where you can just use them algorithms. Um, what I guess what we have been doing um, is some of the deep learning thing, which is a bit different. Um, of course, in that case, you need to have the, the database, as I mentioned, when you've got the, the cracks um, for the road. The biggest problem with that kind of learning is how do you get many examples? And like you rightly mentioned, that no matter how much you train, no matter how much you do, you're always going to encounter things you don't understand. You're always going to encounter things. So I think I personally think the, the, the philosophy is this kind of ask a friend. You see it a lot in industry right now. So you can sell, you can buy industry robots that come into your factory and they're fully autonomous. They go around, they travel around, they carry packages. Um, but from time to time, they find someone's left a chair in the way or something strange has happened and they just don't know. So what they do, they don't actually stop. They phone up the, the factory. There are people in the factory who then can then give guidance and say, in this scenario, you do this. And you can imagine maybe four or five people managing, I don't know, a thousand, two thousand robots, constantly asking these questions. But over time, it can then start to learn about the different environments and what it should do. Um, but I guess it's like a child in a way. Um, you know, with children, you can, you can give them a lot of information at the beginning. But sooner or later, they're going to find things you didn't even expect. And they're going to have to be able to ask us, you know, what, what should I do? Um, and I think that's, that's most, the most important thing is to make sure that they, they ask rather than just doing things that are wrong. Doing things that are wrong damages trust, potentially injures someone. So they should, they should know what they don't know. That makes sense. And then she then go and ask for guidance about what to do next. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Robert, for this nice presentation. And I also like to thank uh, my colleagues, Professor Ahmed Sabah and Dr. Muhammad uh, Ibrahim, for inviting you for such a great. Uh, uh, presentation um, concerning the, uh, uh, the the project of exploring the Great Pyramid. Uh, uh, yeah, and regarding to this project, uh, what are what are the final results that you got, and what about uh, uh, continuing continuing uh, proposing another project uh, to continue in this area? And I think Galileo University can cooperate with you in this issue. Uh, uh, also, you know that uh, we, we uh, here in Egypt we have a lot of uh, of ideas regarding temples, etc. So we can we can have together, uh, yeah, many projects regarding to this issue, exploring the uh, uh, these uh, issues. This first question. So uh, I have another one. So I'm waiting to reply. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's, that's an amazing question. Yes, I mean, um, there there are definitely unanswered questions around. In particular, around I said that that second blocking stone, particularly in that in that case there. So yeah, I, mean, I guess it's my 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 live stream to fulfill that question. So I think I think it's uh, at some point when the time is right, when we're able to do that, um, it would be amazing to go and be able to to continue that work. And I think things have come a long way. So when we were doing this, you know, a few years ago now, technology around sensors, cameras, these kind of things, it's very difficult to actually get the technology. But now we can do so much more. You know, the things we talked talk about in this presentation here, we can do so many more more things smaller things more advanced things that, um yes i mean i think if, if, if we could um find a way to that'd be amazing i think there probably would be scope for like a i guess a joint institute or joint uh, adventures to do that kind of thing would be great um so we have lots of robots lots of technology um of course you and you have lots of skills around what you're doing so yeah that, that'd be amazing if we could find a way of doing that that'd be really good okay thank you it's our pleasure to cooperate together in this issue 
uh, I have a second question. I I I uh, I noticed that uh, most of your work is the single robot. What about multi-agent robot? Uh, yeah, yeah, do you have work uh, uh, in this area of of collaboration uh, uh, of of multi robots together? In, in, in the, and and um, and each robot has had its own role. Yes, yeah, so I think um, most of the work I've done has been single robot. I think with this pro this project Pipebots we're doing um, at the moment is it, very much multi robot. Um, in that case, it really swarms. So we're looking at that, and of course, the, the challenge of swarms, especially when they're small scale, is how do you give them enough intelligence, enough brains to communicate? So. Um, for example, um, these robots being perhaps 20 millimeters, there really is not a lot of space or power to communicate with each other. So um, we're looking at um, being inspired by biology. Um, so we're looking at kind of maybe using like worms um, or, or other things and understanding how they can kind of interact together or ants and trying to understand really basic communication. So how, how do they how do they search? But because they are so small and they're so computationally, um, if you like, small, um, it's quite hard. So I mean, we're looking at things like: do they leave trails? Does it mean for, for ants, for example, when they go around, they leave um, they leave pheromones, they leave trails where they've been? Um, ha, ha, yeah. So they, we're doing a lot of work in the area. So it's not large-scale cooperation, such as robot arms handing things or two hands doing something, but certainly in terms of the swarm side of things and being inspired by biology, we have quite a lot of work in the area. We, well, we, we will have quite a lot of work in the area in, in this pipe book project going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Hrop, uh, for this nice presentation. And uh, Dr. Mohammed, I see someone uh, like to ask a question. Uh, uh, sorry, I have a question. Actually, okay. I have a uh, question. First question, uh, Dr. Robert, you mentioned uh, a drone that carries a 3D printer, and this 3D printer should like batch uh, a crack in the street. How a material of 3D printer can batch a street that uh, should carry a stress of multiple cars and maybe with different weights and so on? And, the most, and another point, the depth of this uh, crack, I mean, it's it, it can go under deep underground. How this 3D printing process can really hold this situation? And what about the cracks that created underground, not not above the ground, that is not seen? Yeah, great, great questions. Yeah, so um, so what we're printing with, we're printing with um, asphalt. So in fact, we have the world's only 3D printing of, of asphalt, which is kind of like a, a tarmac type material. So it's not normal. It's not normal 3D printing. It is a special material. Very interestingly, when you take the asphalt. And you make what we do, we make it into pellets, and then we extrude the pellets. The actual asphalt that comes out is actually stronger than the normal asphalt. And this it took us a long time. We, we found this result and we were really confused. What, what why is it stronger? Something to do with the 3D printing process, aligning things inside the actual asphalt, make it so it's stronger. Um, so so it's a good material. Um, but I take I have to take your point. So and you're right, the anatomy of how, how do roads fail? There are different things that cause fail. There is surface wear, trucks going over, damage in the surface. That's things we can try to do. There are subsurface things that cause cause damage. Mostly it's things like pipes leaking, other things underground potentially. So if, we, if we're able to repair them inside, it's not from the surface, of course, we're repairing the pipes in that case. Um, but there are some things you just can't repair. There are some things, so there's a whole a whole life cycle anatomy of that. And, and you're right that it, if you like, you are just literally potentially um, patching the cracks. Um, so, so we have to be able to, I guess, be aware of that. So we do have some, some work looking at um, satellite images and trying to understand what's around them. So there is some AI there where you can actually understand, OK, this bit of road here, it has some crack defects. But if you look, look next to the road, there's a big tree. Therefore, you can perhaps infer that this, this damage is not caused by a certain kind of thing. Therefore, the tree's the problem. Um, but you're absolutely right that they, yeah, we can't. There's, there's going to be a certain class of roads we can repair, some we can't repair, and then we have to take that into account. Okay, I think now there is no more questions. 
and thank you for this nice presentation and hopefully we are looking forward to seeing you soon in Egypt uh, and it will be live uh, cooperation live presentation and it will be cooperation so hopefully after the uh, COVID pandemic finish if we will try to arrange meeting in Egypt that'd be amazing I'd love that really good okay thank you Thank you. Good to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.